All right, thanks. Uh, I hope this will be fun. I'm going to try to make a, a, a ramble through past, present, and future because I want to talk about what I think are some of the challenges that we face. And so um, if you sort of think about that, here's sort of the, the praises of the talk. I want to talk about uh, the changing nature of, of the problems I think we want to face in technical computing, some of the lessons of exponentials that go with the technology that we sort of taken for granted, uh, and some challenges about how we might reconceptualize uh, uh, advanced computing. Uh, and by then I'll probably be out of ta time and, and we'll be in a place to take some questions. If not, I'll ramble on a little bit about thoughts on the future. So if you think about pretty much everything that most of us who got into computing back when, when David was young and I had hair, um, most of our world was defined by things like this. Most of us who got into technical computing did so because we were drawn in from the physical sciences in one way or the, another. And, and physics-based computing has dominated technical computing essentially from its beginnings. But if you think about the things that are changing, uh, the rise of basically large-scale data from a new generation of scientific instruments, uh, the challenges of big data and the different kinds of scientific problems that go with those, I think are really going to drive some fundamental changes. And a large part of what I want to talk about is what I see as the disconnect between those two worldviews, both the scientific data piece, but also some of the, the issues around big data from a, from a commercial perspective. And I'll try to draw in some of my Microsoft experiences as some of my HPC experiences in, in the academic world. Well, let's just sort of take a couple of those big data things as an example, and I picked one uh, that uh, should be near and dear to many of you in Australia, the SKA. And if you think about what the SKA is going to do, um, you know, most of the history of science, we've lived in a world where data was rare and expensive, and that's sort of the motivation for how the scientific method came about to define experiments and capture data. But, you know, the SKA is going to produce up to 10,000 petabytes of, of signal data a day uh, if it's built at its, its proposed scale. And what that really means is um, there's exascale computing just to do real-time FFTs for data reduction, not to mention the science pieces that go with that. So that there's a huge set of challenges around big, big, big data. In fact, I kid people at the LHC that... You know, if the SKA comes into existence as, as envisioned, the LHC will only be doing small-scale data problems by comparison. But the, the one thing that is true about that, at least, is the data is relatively regular. And if you look at uh, other kinds of environmental sensors, and this is just a U.S. example of the Ocean Observing in Initiative, it's much more heterogeneous. Uh, there's a lot more diversity, and the kinds of data products one would produce are, are much wider than the sort of traditional single domain kind of data analysis that uh, we focused on in the past. So a whole set of different social as well as technical challenges around big data kind of come from those things. But if you think about what's always been true for us um, in computing, we have ridden technology transitions. Um, you know, the whole hype around cloud computing, some of us were old enough to remember when there were commercial time-sharing systems, uh, which is sort of, in some sense, an early version of cloud computing. But we've tracked technology pretty much for the last 50, 60 years, from mechanical devices through vacuum tubes and discrete transistors to, uh, to semiconductors today. And we're kind of in the midst of another one of those transition uh, as we move past commodity clusters into accelerators and, and clouds and and some of the struggles, good and bad, that we had with grids uh, and the challenges around that. There are some issues, though, that I, I think are important around the rise of, of big-scale data analytics in, um, in the private sector. And I'll just show you this comment. One of the things that I'm in the midst of doing right now is a study uh, for the U.S. National Academy of Sciences to look at the state of uh, cyber infrastructure for the U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, and we've done a lot of uh, discussions with various researchers around the U.S. This comment that the talent in data analytics has shifted from science to companies uh, was from an astronomy researcher, and what he was really talking about was the great sucking sound is academic talent being pulled into the private sector uh, by the boom around deep learning and issues around that. So we have some social issues that affect where we're going as well as the technological ones. But 
You know, Jim Gray used to like to say uh, that computing is defined by four capabilities. Uh, the speed and capacity of networking, computation, and, and two-along data access, uh, and that the ratios change those characteristics. Uh, when I was teaching advanced computer architecture, I used to always tell the students that the great thing about computing is the questions don't change, but the answers do. Because fundamentally, we're in the, uh, in the technology optimization business, those of us who are looking at designing machines, and whenever the, the ratios of speeds and feeds and cost change, we get a different optimization point. That's why the answers to the questions change, even though the questions don't. But here's one of the things that I think we have to worry about. Um, and those exponentials are, are driving phenomenal things that are happening in smartphones uh, and in the Internet of Things, but they're also driving a lot of the really interesting things that's been happening on the commercial side with cloud data services. But here's a challenge. Here's another way to sort of look at those market disruptions and think about the history of what's transpired with respect to generations of computing. And as we've gone from mainframes and mini computers and workstations through PCs to smartphones uh, and the, uh, the much hyped uh, um, heralding of the Internet of Things, what happened in every one of those cases was the volume of units sold went up by an order of magnitude. The unit price uh, went down by at least an order of magnitude, and consequently the market size grew by an order of magnitude. Every one of those changes disrupted the status quo from below. Uh, and one of the things that I think we have to think about in technical computing is whether we are semi-frozen in time uh, around a cluster and accelerator-based model and what some of the implications are for the economics that will disrupt us potentially from below. So here's sort of another way to slice that. Uh, if you look at the, uh, um, the history of devices from a, uh, um, a semiconductor scaling perspective, uh, and what I've superimposed on this plot, the red dotted line is actually an exponential fit uh, to the devices that were shipped versus time, and what you're looking at on the vertical axis is, is feature size for chips and, and nanometers. Uh, and you can see what's happened over the last um, uh, 40 plus years. Uh, this is one version of, of how to document um, uh, Moore's hypothesis about uh, chip transistor doubling. And of course we ran into, and I'll come back to this in a moment, sort of a power wall in the early 2000s that drove multicore. But you can also see that feature size is bounded below by zero. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to that. You know, as I was putting this talk together, I was reminded of an old line from Robert Palmer, who was the, the last CEO of digital. Um, and remember, DEC was flying high at one point, and certainly when the DEC Alpha came out, all of us in technical computing were really enamored of the performance of the DEC Alpha. But Palmer said um, rather presciently, designing microprocessors is like playing Russian roulette. You put a gun to your head, you pull the trigger, and you find out four years later if you blew your brains out. <laughs> um, meaning that you, you make these bet the company decisions on shifting technology and you only find out uh, after an irrevocable point whether you're right or wrong. Uh, and we're in some interesting parts of that space right now, I think, with respect to the diminishing returns uh, of what we can squeeze out of, out of silicon, and that's a topic I'll return to. You know, if you really look back, here's an old, old comment from Dick Feynman from 59, um, before uh, Gordon Moore um, wrote his uh, 1965 article saying, computers would be really cool if we could make them really small. Um, and we've been there and done that. Um, one of the real fundamental issues that we have to deal with now is the fact that Denard scaling, which was really the technical aspect that made Moore's Law work, is over. Uh, and there are really, really big issues about that. So here's Moore's original 1965 paper with this highly technical title of cramming more components onto integrated circuits, uh, where he made that uh, rule of thumb observation uh, about what could be true uh, by virtue of engineering investment. And we've all seen, I suspect, multiple versions of the plot that's on the right side of this slide. Uh, and it's really showing the pickle that we're in at the moment. 
So on the one hand, and remember this is a semi-log plot, so on a semi-log plot, a straight line is an exponential. And you can see up there at the top that transistors or chip continue to rise, um, you know, within experimental error. But the bad news is everything else that's below that. That single thread performance, that is sequential execution performance, is pretty much flat. That frequency in megahertz uh, or gigahertz is pretty much flat, and that topped out seven or eight years ago. Uh, chip power has topped out, um, but we're still driving the number of cores up, and that's how we're getting more performance per chip. But our inability to extract more performance due to energy constraints, uh, as well as limits and costs on shrinking feature size, really begs some important questions. And certainly when I started out in computing, I wrote a whole lot of papers about parallel computing saying one of these days we're going to run out of sequential performance and we'll have to do parallel computing. And after about 10 or 15 years, I stopped writing that introduction to papers because I was patently wrong. Uh, but we're increasingly close to that being patently true. Uh, and there's some pretty profound implications uh, about what we do with respect to that. And you can sort of think about two things that might put uh, the kibosh on increasing uh, performance from silicon. One is device physics itself, uh, and there are real fundamental questions about whether we can make things in, a, in an effective way uh, below five nanometer um, uh, half pit sizes for chips. But the other issue is whether the market will support the cost of the fab lines to build those chips. You know, with fab lines in the order of $10 billion US or Australian, you have to ask whether anybody would spend $500 billion to build a semiconductor fab line. The ROI for that kind of capital investment has to be huge. Uh, and so we could run out of gas uh, either because of physics but my bet is we'll run out of gas for economic reasons before we run into the physical limits. But to be sure, there are real issues there, and I'll come back to those uh, a bit later in, in some of the futures. I just wanted to really go back and, and take you back a, a bit to another inflection point, um, and part of the reason why I think we, uh, we may be frozen a bit in time, and this is a bit of my history that David alluded to, when I was NCSA director at Illinois, we rolled out the first uh, large-scale clusters uh, at NCSA into production. And I can tell you, uh, in the U.S., that was a hugely controversial thing. The first time we proposed to deploy commodity clusters, the proposals were rejected and viewed as too radical because there were basic questions about what happens if something breaks in the hardware, who's going to support it. If you're running this crazy open source software, whose neck are you going to ring when there's a software failure? Uh, people were worried about that. Of course, a couple of years later, everyone was doing it. But uh, that's sort of the nature of these cultural transitions. The other one that was a little crazier uh, and was more of a curiosity was um, seeing the kind of performance that existed on the Sony PlayStation 2 and the fact that Sony had re released um, uh, a Linux uh, development kit. We started buying PS2s on eBay because uh, the Linux development kit at the time was only available in Japan so we could build a PlayStation cluster out of it, sort of looking at the, the early notions of what accelerators might make possible. Of course, both of those things are, are commonplace now. Um, and, I, and at the time, IBM was making big, big bets on Linux as open source, and so they were a partner with us uh, as well as, as Intel. So what seems sort of ancient history now was a wild and crazy idea uh, around uh, 1999 or 2000. It's also, I should say, somewhat uh, uh, amazing and reflective of, uh, of performance increases that those two uh, machines that were each one teraflop peak, you know, they were in the top 30 or 40 uh, machines on the top 500 of the fastest machines in the world. Of course, most of us have uh, accelerators and deside uh, development platforms that run at that speed now, but uh, that's sort of the nature of what those exponentials have brought us. Here's another way that oh, I want us to, to maybe think about the nature of exponentials and, and what it means for innovation. Uh, it's a lesson from another domain. If you look at the speed of commercial aircraft, or even, uh, for that matter, military aircraft versus time, 
Uh, it also followed uh, a rapid exponential curve, um, driven, of course, by, uh, in many cases, by technology advances, but by the wars as well. Um, but the speed of commercial aircraft hasn't gotten any faster in the last 50 years. You know, when we fly uh, uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, we're flying no faster than people were flying on a Boeing 707 in the early 1960s. And the one attempt to break out of that in commercial aviation, the Concorde, failed for economic reasons. And so I think there's, there's an interesting corollary there uh, about the, that mix of, of, as I was saying before, about physics uh, versus economics. But although airplanes haven't gotten any faster, at least uh, uh, broad commercial service, uh, there are many loci of innovation that have continued to pace. Uh, and I think that perhaps one of the lessons that we may have to think about in, in technical computing, because in innovations in, in uh, flight have continued in capacity and safety and all the things that you can see there, composites, um, it simply shifted the locus of innovation. And I think whenever the challenges get really hard, when the exponentials get really steep, that's what happens. Uh, and my belief is that we're on the verge of one of those transitions in technical computing. Um, and there are some issues around that. So here's another way maybe to say that. Um, you know, we are in technical computing. We're the tail of the dog, um, but the money that's pulling it forward uh, is clearly right now around machine learning and what's happening in, in mobile devices uh, with a lot of enabling technologies pulling uh, both of them forward. And the reason I talked at the outset sort of about that whole series of technology transitions is we have been the beneficiaries of those. What made commodity clusters widely available and have a huge price performance advantage relative to um, uh, what had come before with custom SMPs uh, and MPPs was that commodity economics that was driving high-speed microprocessors. And we have to look at how those economic forces are shaping us. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk about kind of in the second half of the talk. So think about the dot-com boom, the, the second version of it, um, and why uh, it's happened. Besides the, uh, the mobile apps that we all sort of take for granted and use, uh, it's really been enabled by, I think, three fundamental things. Widespread availability of relatively inexpensive broadband, uh, wired and wireless, um, powerful mobile devices, uh, and of course, the rise of analytics and, and software services on the back end uh, uh, in, in cloud computing and what those things have enabled. One of the reasons that I left the university to go to Microsoft to run the Extreme Computing Group was because I wanted to take some ideas from technical computing and try to apply them to the design of next generation data centers for clouds. Part of what I'm trying to evangelize now is to take some lessons that I learned from the commercial space and clouds and see if we can inject those back into the HPC space. But let me drill down a little bit on the commercial cloud data center space and some of the lessons and issues uh, around those uh, that I think are relevant for us. As I said a, a couple moments ago, some of us are old enough to remember when time sharing existed. Uh, this uh, flyer in the upper right of this slide is actually a, an advertisement for General Electric's time sharing service from uh, the late 1960s. And as I said, I'm old enough to actually have used some of some of those things. Um, you know, data centers built for internet services are really about optimization at a scale. Uh, and I mentioned the, the four axes that Jim Gray used to talk about uh, and how those drove different answers to the same questions. Anytime you increase the order of magnitude of a computing infrastructure by an order of magnitude, or you decrease it by an order of magnitude, some of the gotchas emerge that you really wouldn't have expected uh, before. Uh, and let me just talk about a few of, of what those are and, and how people have tried to address some of them. One of them, uh, and one I spent a lot of time working on um, with my R&D team at Microsoft, was energy efficiency and energy optimization. Uh, and if you think about the large-scale data centers that Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook uh, have and are building around the world, 
they're all sort of in the 20 to 50 megawatts of energy um, and they cost half a billion to a billion dollars US uh, to build uh, and every one of those vendors and, and others are building them multiple of those at scale around the world each year. There are some pretty profound issues about being able to actually deploy those. Uh, the traditional model that we used in data centers and that uh, the commercial sector used in data centers failed for many reasons. And let me sort of illustrate that with uh, a, a graphic around um, that picture of a data center and the things that go with it. It's a bit of an iceberg because the thing that we think of as the computing is actually the, the least expensive and perhaps the smallest part of the data center. Uh, besides uh, the command and control center, there are all the utility infrastructure that goes around it for power and cooling, backup, and everything else. At one point during the, uh, the Gulf War, the single biggest limiter for global deployment of data centers was the lack of availability for diesel backup generators. And there was a global bidding war uh, to secure places uh, in the production line for those. Uh, so there are a lot of things like that that shape the design and put constraints on uh, on what people could build. I'll tell you a couple of stories about that. One, the first uh, few months after I arrived at Microsoft and I was just figuring out what some of the problems were to face, I went to one of Microsoft's data centers that was in the Columbia Valley of Washington uh, on the Columbia River where uh, early on aluminum smelting, bauxite smelting plants had been built because of access to cheap hydropower and that's the same reason the data centers were there. I encountered one person um, whose sole job as a full-time employee was cardboard recycling. And I said, well, besides the question which I didn't ask was, did you ever think when you were in primary school that your job someday would be full-time cardboard recycling? I kept that question to myself, um, but I asked why, why is this such a big issue? And they said, well, you know, we're deploying 75,000 servers in this data center, and when we ordered them from the vendor at the time, they all came individually packaged for our protection because no one had ever ordered 75,000 servers before to a single site, and that's how you would normally package them. So a lot of those issues at scale just drove rethinking about what are the right size building blocks. So a lot of the conversations around shipping containers filled with servers were driven by that. The time to deployment is a big issue. And so I saw the same thing early on when we were deploying commodity clusters at NCSA. When we bought 500 or 1,000 servers, they also showed up all individually wrapped for our protection, and we unpacked them and put them together. But the actual cost of money for that time to integrate things is very real. And so people wanted to shift the cost burden to the manufacturer, not to the deployer, and that drove a lot of conversations, as I said, around shipping containers and other kinds of issues. One last anecdote was anyone who walked into a data center from the 1960s up until the last five or six years generally reached for an overcoat or didn't stay very long because they were cool for polar bear habitation. Um, one of the fundamental questions people started to ask was, do we actually need to keep data centers that cold? And the answer turns out to be, no, we don't. So rethinking those sort of assumptions about temperature and humidity were really important because a big chunk of the energy to run a data center actually goes into cooling, not just running the equipment. And that drove a lot of conversations around power usage effectiveness, the so-called PUE metrics about what fraction was facility power versus IT equipment power. One other thing that, that drove big changes was thinking about um, ambient air cooling uh, and the constraints on water. The traditional data center model of using evaporative cooling relied on pretty much drinkable quality water and a big commercial data center could easily evaporate uh, well over a million liters of drinkable water a day. Uh, and you think about the environmental implications of that on the one hand and the places you might want to build data centers where a million liters of drinking water is a really valuable quantity. And a whole lot of different issues uh, had to be reconsidered. And that's why I say this challenge of scale uh, drives rethinking of a large number of issues. And those issues about ratios really become very important.
I want to draw one other piece to sort of think about this end-to-end -end uh, continuum because I want to connect it back to the fundamental issue I started with about the rise of big data and science and how we think about sensors and back-end analytics. One project I started at Microsoft, and the technology really wasn't quite ready at the time, but we're starting to see pieces of it emerge now, was uh, uh, what we see now with Siri or with Cortana, where you can ask questions. You have this notion of an intelligent assistant. I wanted to build a device that would use a, uh, that would do, in essence, what um, um, a protocol for protocol officer does for any head of state. They stand next to the person in a receiving line and they whisper tidbits of information into the person's ear about the people they're meeting. Uh, and I wanted to be able to take pictures, do feature extraction, facial recognition, extract information from public sources and provide that uh, unobtrusively in someone's ear. Tech wasn't quite ready for that, but it brought up a whole lot of issues about what are the end-to-end -end optimization challenges from what you can run on your mobile device, what the bandwidth constraints are for communication, typically over wireless, and what you can do on the back end, and what kind of time of flight delays you can tolerate. That example I was talking about, if you try to do all the image processing on your mobile device, your battery won't last very long. And of course, it's a low power uh, ARM processor, and so you've got some real constraints on what you can do there. Uh, you've also got time of flight delays back to the data center. Um, one of the things that's absolutely true uh, if you type in a web search query, you don't get the best answer that the search engine can give you. You get the best answer that the search engine can give you in about 150 milliseconds. And that's driven largely by an understanding of the subliminal point at which you start to express annoyance, even though it might not rise to the level of cognition. So there's some constraints on those kind of things. So as we think about the sort of rise of mobile devices uh, and augmented reality and intelligent assistance, this end-to-end -end optimization problem becomes very, very real. Uh, and the same problem I would posit for those of us in technical computing exists for a world of environmental sensors and back-end data analysis. That There are analogs to what we do on the front end, what we do on the back end, how we manage the power and bandwidth constraints that, uh, that go with that. We have a long conversation about what's horribly broken about spectrum all allocation around the whole world, and I can assure you the Australian version of the frequency allocation map is just as horrid as the U.S. one is, because most of these things are defined by international treaties. Um, and there were a bunch of issues around that, but I'd be happy to talk about those in the Q&A if people are interested in that. So here's sort of the other thing I want you to think about, about what has happened uh, with respect to technology shifts in the mobile and also in the, in the data center space and how it's driving change. We've gone from a world where we went to vendors and we bought hardware to one where at scale people didn't go to vendors, they went to OEMs. And then at some point, they bypassed the OEMs and they went directly to the original design manufacturers, the folks who actually build the stuff. So if you go to any of the computer companies that we know of, that you think of as, as the places that are, are actually the purveyors of the product, in very few cases do they actually design and fab them themselves. Right? That's what the Foxcons and the Quantas of the world do. They actually build the stuff and, and do design to spec. But increasingly, people are starting to bypass even that at scale. Uh, and the place that it's manifest in silicon is we've gone from proprietary to commodity to tailored. And if you're an, uh, an Amazon or a Google, uh, they've been public and, and other folks have not been public, but it's still true. You buy enough microprocessors from Intel, you actually can get them to design features into x86 processors that you and I can't buy because they are such a large fraction of the total volume. So they have influence on specialization in a way that the technical computing market and aggregate doesn't. But even that is moving, and it's moving, and, and this is a place that I think is really interesting, it's moving to a world of customer-designed SOCs and the use of FPGA accelerators, partly driven by the desire to get more ops per joule. Uh, and if you think about how to get more ops per joule, 
it's really functional specialization. And so that's, that's what's made GPU successful in technical computing, right? You get better ops per joule, you get uh, higher performance because you're really relying on data regularity. Um, the rise of FPGAs poses for all of us some really profound issues about programmability. You know, the, the challenges that we never really solved about compiler compilers automatic synthesis of compilers for high-level languages and domain-specific case. Pretty profound issues around that. But here's the thing I want you to take away from this slide with respect to all that stuff about intelligent assistance and cloud services and what it means for sensors and scientific computing. If you look at that box in the upper right of, of this slide, you know, we're moving from a world of offline, that is batch process oriented technical computing to with real time data sensors needing to do more real time computation and analysis. Uh, likewise, the world of cloud services is moving away from a transaction based model <clears throat> to one that is more model based. So anything that does augmented reality or looks at situational awareness has to have some, maybe a cartoon physics model, but a physics model nevertheless to support that predictive capability. There's a convergence there uh, of those two worlds, and I think opportunities for us to do some interesting things together around that. Here's one other quick uh, notion. These are some pictures of some of the shipping container um, construction that both Google and Microsoft have put together. And there are pros and cons about shipping containers, I'll be the first to admit. But a lot of the things I said about right sizing uh, and, and maximizing total cost of ownership are driven by thinking about scaling issues. But here's a, here's a social disconnect, I think, between what's happened in commercial services and what we do in technical computing. We focused a lot on fault tolerant MPI and alternative checkpoint models to be able to build resilience. We're starting to think about algorithmic resilience but the commercial services world early on embraced the fact that it was running on unreliable hardware and that what it really needed to support was service resilience um, and service continuity. So if you use a streaming video service like Netflix, um, their Chaos Monkey uh, environmental service actually goes and kills services in the back end to see if the QoS, the quality of service, is maintained. Uh, and it's a pretty big leap to imagine a world where you would gleefully log on to your HPC system and do a kill minus nine of running processes just to see if your application kept running. So there, there's, there's some, some opportunities to think about that intersection. Which is really what I was just saying. So here are a few sort of, of the have you ever kind of, of questions. Uh, we tend in, in technical computing to do batch scheduling for increments of a few hours, but the notion of requesting infrastructure for a period of years because it has to support a sustained experiment is a, is a little bit of a different reach. Um, I just mentioned this one. Have you ever logged on a node and kill processes just to see what would happen? Um, not not uh, probably very often if the assistant administrators caught you. Um, Virtualization has been big in, in the rest of the world for a long time, but containerization, that is OS virtualization rather than machine virtualization, is probably the hottest topic going on uh, right now. And I think there are some lessons for us uh, that could go there. Um, this issue of back-end sensors and, and front-end analytics, um, there are issues around that. Um, you know, sand versus land storage or local storage, there are a bunch of issues around those. Um, I'm going to come back to recommendation systems in a moment. And then, of course, uh, a completely disjoint almost set of programming tools and languages across the two cultures. Uh, some opportunities to think about, uh, about those as well. This is a, a, a picture from uh, an article that Jack Dongara and I wrote that appeared in the communications of the ACM a couple months ago, uh, trying to do draw comparison and contrast between the software stacks that exist uh, in the commercial world and what we do in HPC. And the truth is down at the bottom, the hardware is very, very similar uh, with some of the provisions I mentioned earlier. But if you climb up above that um, um, Linux OS variant, 
it pretty much completely diverges. Uh, it diverges in terms of the tool chain, certainly diverges in terms of our approach to I.O., um, and libraries pretty much everything else. To me, one of the great opportunities for us in technical computing is to think about how to reintegrate those. And both because we need a lot of those ideas from the commercial side to support scientific data analytics, but also because they need some of the lessons and insights we have from technical computing to inform some of those model-based computations for intelligent assistance and other kinds of things. So in the rest of the world, as Mark Andreessen is fond of saying, uh, software is eating the world. Um, containerization I mentioned earlier, uh, but software-defined networks, software-defined storage are all the rage. Uh, there are opportunities and lessons, I think, for us to, to draw from those and think about what that means in technical computing, what it might mean to provision uh, a network to support your application uh, in addition to uh, thinking about just provisioning it with MPI. Same thing about software-defined storage. Let me just in conclusion say just a couple quick things about big data uh, and where I think some of the silicon futures might go. So think about all of the things that we sort of take for granted in our non-professional uh, lives about using cloud and web services uh, and all the kind of recommender systems that go with that. Whether it be item hierarchy, you bought one thing, you're going to buy something else related to it, attributes or item similarities, user similarities, social networks, all of those things are, are recommender techniques that are built in all of the things that, that we use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there is this intersection point I just mentioned about how we think about model-based uh, machine learning and some opportunities around that. And so here's uh, an example that um, I to give credit to Dennis Gannon about. You know, supervised and unsupervised machine learning has some pretty profound opportunities for us uh, to think about classification and analysis. I think one of the reasons that we're sometimes sociologically troubled by it is sort of by definition, if you do training, um, you don't necessarily understand the causality that drives the outcome. Uh, and we may have to get past that and accept that we may not actually always understand the causality that we would have if we were doing solely algorithmic analysis. So something to think about there. Let me conclude by just offering a couple comments about the end of Moore's law, uh, at least in terms of performance doubling, we're not, uh, Moore's law in the sense he meant was about transistor density, but that single thread performance constraint. Uh, and this is a, um, I'm going to show you some uh, comparisons from uh, a study that was part of the Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, there was a, a big confab in the U.S. in the spring that I was part of. Uh, they just released their report called Rebooting the IT Revolution, uh, and it's trying to talk about some of these silicon challenges uh, and some opportunities. And this is sort of a compare and contrast about how much headroom we actually have uh, versus where we are, and it's a, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comparison of analog brains and digital computers. So and if you think about the one side, you know, brains are uh, parallel and distributed. They're pretty low power. Um, you know, I'm running at about 25 watts here, uh, as are you. Um, pretty small volume. It's asynchronous. It's definitely analog. Um, memory and computation, well, we hope they're integrated. At least most of the time they are. Um, we learn, at least I like to think so as a professor, they are very noisy components. They're very slow. Um, but they are spontaneously active. Um, the flip side, almost all of the, the complements are true on the digital side. Notwithstanding what we do in parallel computing, they're still mostly serial architectures. Uh, at the chip level, they are quite high power. Um, they have a very large footprint. They're synchronous. They're digital. We separate memory and computation. We program them. Um, and we generally build them out of precise components, expect them to operate at high speed, and they're largely passive unless we do something. 
to sort of put that in a different context, and this is the report, the Rebooting the IT Revolution. You can download it uh, if you uh, search for uh, those phrases. Sort of put this in perspective and think about how small a picajoule actually is. Uh, with 100 picajoules, you can run an ARM Cortex-M0 for 10 cycles, and you can write one bit of flash. You can read the rest of those. 100 picojoules doesn't do very much, uh, and a kilowatt is 3.6 megajoules. So we've got a bunch of headroom there, uh, both in theory and practice, but to reach that point, we're probably going to have to profoundly and fundamentally rethink some things, and that's what I want to leave you uh, with just a couple quick things to think about. One of them is it's quite possible that uh, analog computing will make a comeback. You know, the success of almost all that we take for granted in computing has been based on abstraction layers. And there's some truth to the old computer science joke that there's no problem in computing that can't be solved with another layer of indirection. Uh, and we've done that successfully for years. But as I just said and I said earlier, ops per jewel really rewards specialization, but software rewards generality. Uh, and if we think about how to move past what uh, the Turing model might is, it's pretty deeply embedded in our culture and our sociology and the way we think about things. Here's one thing I really want you to think hard about. Notwithstanding all we know as scientists, we have this amazing tendency to believe that when we run a computation, we get the answer. And in no other part of science would we approach the world that way. If I ask you how long my finger was, uh, if you thought about it for a moment, you would give me an answer with some error bounds. And so how we think about that notion of approximate computing and whether a computation is even an unbiased sample of the true solution space has got a bunch of issues. And we need to think about what that notion of, of approximate computing uh, and estimates might be. So last slide, it's pretty clear we're going to need some conceptual breakthroughs. Uh, this general purpose versus uh, special purpose issue. Um, and we have to do it in a context that recognizes economic reality. We've ridden an enormous economic boom with technical computing uh, and, in fact, with consumer computing. Specialization drives you into a place where the parts volumes per specialized part are much smaller. The only way that's going to be economically viable is if the cost to design them is very small. And that means we have to do a lot of experiments very quickly to be able to figure out those alternatives. It's pretty clear that the, the, the action is at both extremes of cloud data centers and exascale HPC because they're really fundamentally not that different technologically. Uh, but also how we think about mobile sensors for science uh, and the Internet of Things and how we find solutions to those. I don't think they're necessarily the same. Um, what we might look forward to, quantum computing, if you believe it will stop being the technology of the future and, and reach fruition at some point, is pretty profound. You know, a bunch of issues around neuromorphic computing as well. You know, just on the, on the quantum computing front, remember that um, in quantum computing, liquid helium is a very, very hot liquid. You know, three degrees Kelvin is a very high temperature. Um, being able to operate at a few millikelvin is a pretty profound engineering issue um, beyond just the other issues around um, the stability of qubits. But the best way to find an answer is to try a bunch of things. So, David, that's, that's my story. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain questions.